Hi, my name is Nancy Rademach, and I'm very happy to speak for you today. And um, I will talk to you a bit about the, finding this sweet spot between high tech on the one hand and high touch on the other hand. And I'm really happy with how this greatly aligns with ECOR's mission to connect people and technology to build a better future together. And that's what it's all about. It's about survival in what I call the next normal. And the next normal basically is this era where we've moved from digital being a novelty to digital becoming the new norm. And I must say that some people from the old normal still suffer a little bit in this future full of technology. And so over the past year with the pandemic, we've witnessed a dramatic um, uh, change and a dramatic acceleration in digital. And again, all normal people suffer from this, like my dad who got his first video call from my daughter and he did not have a clue what was going on. And some people still find it hard weaving in technology into their daily existence. Now, the point with technology, I don't think I need to tell you, is that this evolves in an exponential way. And we see that in the evolution of computing power, the amount of data, the amount of devices, and in the evolution, the explosion, exponential explosion of AI algorithms. And the problem with this exponential technology is that we as humans have a linear working brain. And if we look at exponential innovation, that's where we see it go wrong. Because exponential innovation starts a bit negative at first, um, and execs think it's, go it's go going to continue that way, but then all of a sudden it goes boom. And it's in between the lines of exponential and linear that disruption really occurs. Now, just last year, execs were asked to predict whether they saw significant industry disruption coming within their sector. And three quarters of them say yes, and that number had already tripled from the year before. And this industry disruption is coming from these three things, from new technologies, from new competition, and from higher expectations amongst customers. And because of this disruption going on, leaders find themselves in these massive splits. I mean, you can't just let go of the old normal, you can't just stop what you're doing. And at the same time, you know that something's got to change, that you need to start doing things differently. Because in this age of disruption, one way of doing things differently is innovating. And I think innovation needs to take place on three levels. We need to innovate in the now, we need to innovate in the next, and we need to innovate in what I call the beyond. So first of all, it's about improving the now, improving your current business model, making these small incremental changes to continuously improve. Some say that, you know, this is not true innovation. It might not be technically speaking, but it is crucially important. Then it's about creating the next. It's about, you know, looking for new business models, looking for new markets. In old school marketing, this used to be called diversification. But the most important one is this. It's about imagining the beyond. Daring to look ahead five, 10, 15 years from now, imagine what the world will look like then, and then work your way back to the now to start figuring out what you need to do now in order to get there. Which is, by the way, completely reversed to what companies used to do, or maybe some still do, which is look at the past or at best the present, and use these numbers and extrapolate from there to determine our future. So there needs to be a mindset shift um, and imagining the beyond is going to be crucial. Now with all this innovation, of course, there's one thing that we need to take into account and that some organizations forget. We as humans don't like change. And so one big thing in digital transformations is getting over this resistance to change. And I'll get back to that later on. Now, I mentioned the next normal at the beginning, and this next normal has been evolving. We've gone through a number of digital ages, and every single one builds on top of the previous one. And they, you know, they, they get there faster than ever. They also 
um, have this exponential evolution. And we currently find ourselves in this augmented age with AI at its core. And I used to say that we were on the cusp of entering the age of well-being, but with the pandemic, of course, I can say that we've entered this age at the same time at lightning speed. And this is about our physical well-being, of course, our mental well-being, but it's also about our social well-being, about inclusion, feeling of belonging, about our financial well-being, and then, of course, also about the well-being of the environment, about sustainability. Now, it is safe to say that because of all these ages, technology has really turned our world upside down and it will continue to do so in the near future. And so, yes, it has changed companies some dramatically. But for me, what's most important is that it has changed us as humans. And I always like to use the model of the five eyes. These are five characteristics that are either completely new or have become more prominent because of all these technological evolutions. First of all, we've become much more informed. There's almost 5 billion of us on the internet and more than 5 billion of us um, having a mobile phone. And this has really become our umbilical cord to the world. It's our life, as Steve Jobs used to say, we are holding our life in our hands. And where we used to have some time to ourselves every now and then in the past, we are now continuously online. We cannot be at a greater distance of our devices than two max three feet. We've all become zombies, smartphone zombies. And I can tell you that some cities have even taken their um, the infrastructure, um, they've changed the infrastructure, I must, must say, to take the zombies into account, creating separate walking lanes for people with a phone and for people without. And now one thing to get from here is that because we are so informed, um, we are also overloaded with information quite quickly. There's just too many choices for us. And therefore, the big challenge for every company out there is to make it very simple for their customer. Act as the curator of information, so to speak, to reduce our stress of choice. Secondly, we've also become much more individualistic. We've literally put ourselves in the center of our very own universe. And the biggest metaphor for this individualism is, of course, the selfie, where we put ourselves in the center of the picture with the celebrity or the disaster as a mere background. And I must say that some people in the old normal still have quite some difficulty creating their own selfies. We've also become much more impatient. Our span of attention has gone down from 15 seconds in the 1970s to just 7.6 seconds these days, which means that we are now officially beaten by the goldfish that has a span of attention of eight seconds. We have literally all become the swipe generation. And we don't like waiting, not at hotel reception desks, nor at the, in the supermarkets. And so that's, for example, why Amazon came up with its Go concept, where you can actually do all of your shopping, um, put it in your bag because you got recognized through your phone anyway when you walked in. And then at the very end, you just walk out. That's their slogan. And everything will be taken care of. And by the, the time you hit the curb, your account has been set up. Fourthly, we've also become much more intuitive. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, our brain consists of these two parts. We've got our rational brain and we've got our intuitive or emotional brain. And most of us like to think of ourselves as rational human beings, right? But it's in fact the intuitive brain that's 40 times faster and that actually makes all of the decisions. In fact, our rational brain acts as a sort of referee, to, so to speak. So keeping us from doing things that are bad for us. It's, it's keeping me from eating all the chocolate I encounter, for example. But it's also this layer of rationality on top of our intuitive decisions. And what you need to take into account as an organization is because our heads are so full that the rational brain kind of loses its referee function and you have to deal with intuitive or emotional customers. And then last but not least, we've also become much more influenced. Um, at the beginning of this year, globally, we spent two and a half hours uh, on our social media every single day. And I'm dead certain that this has gone up. 
And that's also the reason why most of us don't believe what companies tell us in their ads anymore. Um, and we rely on um, our peer recommendations instead. So we rather trust our peers than we do the organizations. And this is also, you know, this being influenced the reason why reviews have become so immensely important. So five characteristics of the new human. And mind you, these are not static either. They are dynamic. They keep on changing. I'll probably be talking about different and new ones um, next year. So we have to take that into account. It's, it's dynamic. It changes all the time. And so that's why I say that in this next normal, agility will be crucial. And this is reinforced by the fact that product life cycles are shortening, technologies are improving ever faster, and the consumer market is leading. Whatever we experience as consumers, we want to experience in exactly the same way in, for example, a business-to-business -business situation. And then next to agility, um, it means that our strategy can no longer be rigid, no more um, five-year plans that are fixed in stone. It has to be fluid instead. And I love this quote from Jack Ma, the former um, CEO of Alibaba, who said, at Alibaba, we don't have strategy. We do continuous A-B testing every single day, and we adapt accordingly, preferably within two days. Now that's fluidity, isn't it? And so what, what is it that we can learn from disruptors like Alibaba and many others out there? Well, in my view, there's, there's two lessons um, to take from, from them. The first and the most important one, I think, is this one. In whatever you do, do not start with your product or service, but start with the customer. Be customer obsessed, as Jeff Bezos said. You know, he said, at Amazon, we start with the customer and then we'll work our way backwards. In this current battle for the customer that we experience, um, CX, customer experience, truly comes first. And if I were to ask some of you, you know, what's your definition on customer experience? I would probably get as many definitions as, you know, people that, that I ask. So if I add mine to that, I would say that the customer experience is the perception that the customer has of whatever interaction that he has with your organization um, relative to his expectations. And so if it's, it meets expectations, it's a good customer experience, otherwise it's not. And if it exceeds expectations, then it's really a wow factor. Now, for some companies, there might be as many as 200 of these experiences or touch points, as some people call them. And so it's about carefully reviewing those, analyzing those, um, looking for where to change, getting rid of some, creating new ones. This is what I meant with improving the now. And then if that's what you do, if you design the customer experience for your customer, make sure that you do this with the customer in mind. And I must say that this is an area where sometimes IT experts tend to fail because they create these wonderful interfaces that they themselves really love and think are fantastic, but they forget to take the customer's perspective into view. So that's the first lesson, start with the customer. The second one is um, about technology. It's about adapting to and adopting the new technologies. That's what the disruptors do so well. They use all of these emerging technologies. So yes, it is about high tech. It's about all these wonderful things that are, that are out there. And technology is making huge strides, as I said on the beginning, in the fields of big data, AI, VR, AR, brain-computer interfaces, um, but also things like blockchain. And at the very same time, maybe needless to say, for many organizations, high tech is also an immense source of disruption. Whichever way, you know, high tech is an enabler and it's, it enables companies to um, seek new markets, redefine them, the markets they can address. It's also a way to turn data into insights, into value for your organization, for your customers. It's a way to redesign the experience for customers. 
It's a way to radically automate um, um, the company. And finally, it's also a way to create or become part of these wonderful open ecosystems out there. And with so many possibilities, of course, the question then is where to put your money. And next to that, uh, one um, factor that might complicate stuff is this, it's Martech's law, stating that technology changes exponentially, but organizations change logarithmically. And so technology management has really to decide which um, changes are um, um, adopted. And even if there's some cataclysmic event at, at, at one uh, uh, point in time, which we saw happening with the pandemic, you see that digital transformation is speeding up. And for, for most companies, this has been the case. 97% of them said it has sped up digital transformation in some way, and about two thirds it, say it's, um, it's sped it up a great deal. But still, you have to deal with this, um, with this gap between the change in technology and the change in adoption. Now, as I talked about the augmented age with AI at its core, of course, I will focus on the combination of big data and AI for a bit. Usually when I'm on stage, I would ask people, you know, tell me if you have an AI strategy. And I must tell you that most of the time I don't see too many hands raised. Well, at the same time, a couple of years ago already, the CEO of eBay said that if you don't have an AI strategy now, you're going to die in the world that's coming. So in this world, what I call the beyond, it is crucial to have this AI strategy because, you know, as consumers, we're already being influenced by algorithms massively. Um, they make all kinds of predictions on what we want and what we like. So the music we like to listen to, the shows we like to watch, even who we like to date. And they can be used to make all kinds of predictions in almost any aspect of business um, as well. Amazon uses um, AI algorithms to predict demand and not just the article, but also the size and the color so that they can move it to the right warehouse where the robots can pick it so that they can fulfill on their delivery promise. And if you put sensors to machines, the algorithms can alert you uh, when the machines are about to break down, enabling you to do preventative maintenance. And of course, as we all know, um, algorithms can be used to optimize routes so that you can compute a delivery time, um, which makes that for the delivery company, there will be a much higher success rate in their first delivery attempt. And what I think is so great about um, AI is that it is strong at what I call weak features. So what do I mean by that? Let me show you um, based on this example. There's a Chinese company called Smart Finance and they provide loans to people, small loans up to $300 to people who would normally not get a loan. And they don't ask for the, you know, the usual stuff that other um, financial institutions would do in order to determine your credit worthiness. So they don't ask where you live, what your profession is, how much money you make, um, what um, education you have, because you know, their customers wouldn't qualify anyway. Instead, they ask for access to a specific subset on your phone. And so they take into account features like um, how often do you burn through your battery? How fast do you swipe? How fast did you type in your birthday when you applied for the loan? Do you have gambling apps on your phone? Um, do you send more text or do you receive more text? All of these parameters, which are weak features, but we don't think influence our credit worthiness immediately. But it's the combination of these parameters that do. And mind you, we as humans can take three parameters into account uh, plus time, but these become 9,000 dimensional problems. It's the combination of all these parameters together that enable them to create an algorithm that can predict whether I will repay the loan with a 96% accuracy. And that's the wonderful, um, um, let's say, characteristic of AI. And by the way, there's some counterintuitive findings there as well. So you are more credit worthy if you burn through your battery more often, 
if you have gambling apps or more gambling apps on your phone, and if you receive more texts than you send. Wow. So I hope that makes it clear that you know data is really at the heart of the matter. And the thing for most companies there, you know, um, is to monetize the data. And this requires a new mindset, not thinking from products and services, thinking from the data. And there is still a lot of room for improvement because as McKinsey showed, only 1% of industrial data is being used today. And I think that another complicating factor is that many of the insights that we could gather are buried in silos uh, with global companies across geographies, within local companies across departments, and of course, also across applications. So in this high tech um, era, if you want to achieve digital transformation, this is what it's about. It's about leveraging data and leveraging new technologies. And if we look at retail, for example, in, in, in supermarkets, they will have to do that if they want to survive. And if you take a closer look at this image, um, you can see all the different aspects, all related to AI that can be taken into account in supermarkets. And I've done guest lectures for uh, big supermarket um, concerns or, or globally, and this is what they are working on um, today. But mind you, so it's not using data and technology to digitize your existing processes, because that would just be old wine in new bottles. It's doing the same old stuff, but then in another way. Instead, it should be to truly transform your organization, to reinvent your business, to be ready for this new digital world. And I love this example of, of United. Oh, sorry, it's not American Airlines. Um, they transformed their business model completely through, um, for example, their mileage program. And that was, was enabled by digital and digital transformation. So they don't make their money taking passengers from A to B. This is where they get their biggest revenue from. In fact, they would be losing money if they didn't have this program. And more locally, you know, in, in, in Belgium, close to where I live, um, there's this local bank called KBC. They use technology to become a partner in their customers' lives. Through their app, they have a great offering of services in mobility, you know, by selling tickets for buses, trains, trams, and what have you, bikes and shared cars as well. But also partnering, for example, with a parking provider. If you register your license, you can just you know, enter a parking and you get recognized automatically and the session gets started and at the end payment is taken care of. So lots of collaborations with third parties to make life easier for their customers, but also of course to create these new revenue streams. And lots of the functionalities can also be used by their non-customers, but maximum ease occurs when you are a customer. And so it really helped them to expand their customer base, especially um, their male customer base when they started to send out alerts on football scores and even showed um, live streams on the app. So in short, there is huge opportunity. And one thing that we need to take into account as an organization is, um, is this, and it's called, I think, Amara's Law. With many of the new technologies, we kind of overestimate what it can do at the beginning and then later on underestimate um, the change that it can bring about. And this is something that we need to be mindful of. So I hope I made clear how high tech is a first coping mechanism for this changed playing field in the next normal. The second one, and you know from the title already, don't you, is um, high touch. And that means taking the changed human into account, really. As I mentioned the, in the battle for the customer, it is about CX. Um, and some people ask me, is it, is, it, is it that important? Well, if you look at the research, it is. You know, Forbes um, found that people are very much willing to pay more for a very good customer experience. And other research showed that even after uh, the pandemic, people care more about CX than ever before. So if we go back to these five eyes of the new human, I believe that you can take each and every single one of them 
and turn them into several aspects that can greatly improve the customer experience. An excellent CX will generate growth in both new and existing customers. So it will demand from you a great brand, but also an excellent experience to acquire new ones. Um, and certainly an excellent CX to retain your current ones. So first of all, remember we're so informed, it needs to be about transparency. You need to be absolutely transparent in fields like security, where you store my data. Also in privacy, um, how you use my data. And this is an example where it's not taken care of so, so well. Dad says you're spying us online, says the little one. And he answers, he's not your dad. And then it's also about transparency in pricing. Make absolutely clear to your customer how your fee comes about. This is what one of the payment providers, um, RDN, did so well. So they really were very transparent about um, the margins that they took. And this is how they onboarded so many organizations in such a short period of time. And I'm mentioning this because this is a Dutch company, so I'm kind of proud of that. And then it's also about um, being transparent on sustainability. So, for example, the, the, the B Corp um, label serves as this, this marker for um, ethical and environmental credentials of companies. So they aim for positive impact on employees, communities, and the environment. And I must say, we've, we've moved away from this zero sum game in the past towards this positive sum game these days. So we don't want to choose anymore between better for me or better for the world. We want both at the same time. So we don't just want to buy a product. We want to make some kind of impact with it either directly with the product or indirectly because the company does good for the environment, for sustainability. And so it's no longer just about shareholder value. It's also about contributing to this better world. Now, next, remember that we are, have become so individualistic. Um, customers expect from you that everything is tailored. It has to be highly personalized. There is no such thing as a one size fits all. If we look at the behavior of men and women shopping, um, we already see huge differences. Just watch. See, and that's just gender alone. So we need to move away from, from the mass towards the individual in, in any aspect um, of business. We need to personalize as much as we can. So we, we already see this with personalized shoes, with personalized food. Based on your um, fit data, you get a meal suggestion with exactly the right nutritional ingredients to enhance your performance even more. In medicine, you have precision or personalized medicine where the dosage is computed based on your genome. There can't be anything more personalized than that, can there? And then if, we, if you find yourself, for example, in a B2B situation, you can also have personalized conversations and tech can help you here. So there's this, um, this app called Crystal Nose that uses AI to the max that allows you to connect it, for example, to your LinkedIn. And then when you look up someone you don't know, it will um, tell you what um, the predicted personality of this human being is based on all kinds of public feeds of this person. And it will also show you how you relate to this person with your personality. So if you look carefully toward all these orange um, circles, you find more about my personality. Um, and I'm telling you, it is scarily accurate, but it's not just that, it will also, you know, give you nudges on how to behave in conversations. If you need to call this client to discuss pricing, the app will tell you what to do and certainly what not to do. So this is about personalization. Of course, you need to be careful not to make it too personal. I mean, one um, um, supermarket chain in the UK called Target um, got insights through their own data, their first party data, into which of their customers were pregnant. So 
so young young um, girls being pregnant without even their families knowing about it. And what gave them away, so to speak, was um, scent-free soap and um, max um, um, sizes of cotton balls. So be careful about that, how you use the data. And then secondly, it's also about if you say that you make it personal, you have to really um, uh, do as you say. And then thirdly, remember that we are so impatient. Remember the goldfish. It is about convenience. Uh, it's making it easy for me, making it simple, and at the same time, making it fast, about speed. And FAST is also this acronym for these four things that will help you, um, you know, if you want to think about how to make stuff more convenient for your customers. So first of all, it's about creating these frictionless experiences. That's what happened with mobile payments, for example. Um, very easy, just put your phone under, the, under this uh, device and, and payment is taken care of. China has become a cashless society. When I was there, well, the last time was 2019, of course, um, already when I took out um, cash or a credit card, people would look at me as if I were an alien. It's completely cashless, meaning that the beggars need a QR code as well these days, or they wouldn't collect any money at all. Next to being frictionless, it should also be about accessibility. So that's about accessibility of your company. Can you be easily reached? Does your customer service provide quick solutions to problems? And next to that, accessibility is also about the interface. This used to be the not so accessible interface in the old days when we wanted to uh, transfer a file. And so that's what WeTransfer has fixed with a much better UX, accessible UX, um, where you just fill in three things and then press the transfer button. And I must say, you know, for many um, um, tools, this is some, still something they need to work on. Um, also for Zoom, we've saw, we saw an explosion of Zoom use um, during the pandemic, but you could see that for some people, not everything was as accessible um, as Zoom probably wanted it to be, leading to this hilarious quote from a lawyer who had a cat filter installed on his Zoom by his young daughter, and he did not have a clue how to take it off. Then next, it's also about self-service. Now, remember I showed you the hotel reception desk earlier at the beginning of my presentation. With um, this chain called Citizen M, there is no reception desk in the hotel. You enter this, this um, hotel and you do self-check-in. And they didn't do this to cut down on personnel, mind you, because they're all, there's always someone around to help you out. But instead, they use this space that would normally be reserved for reception desk for a living room um, style area where their clients could um, chill out. And then finally, it's about applying technology in order to achieve this convenience. And I don't know if you know this app, we are absolutely stunned uh, by it in, in, in Europe from Domino's. I think they are really the champions with the zero clicks app where you just open the app and when you do nothing for 10 seconds, your favorite pizza gets delivered to your doorstep within half an hour. That's what I call convenience. And if this is something that you're capable of, making it low effort for your customers to do business with you, that's when you probably can retain them as being your customers. So ask yourselves time and time again, can we make it any easier on our customers? And then remember I talked about our brain and our intuitive brain that's so much faster, emotional brain. One thing that, that we as humans do, and this is where we differ from machines, is that we like laughing. We like to be presented with humor. In some organizations, this tends to be forgotten. Um, and I would say, do this, put in a, a bit of humor. Um, because a smile really adds to the experience, it's, even in, in times of, of crisis, as with the pandemic. And I love this one on the right hand side, which is come in and try the worst salad one woman on TripAdvisor ever had in her life. By the way, I think it's brilliant to turn negative feedback into something funny like this. And if you look on the left hand side, of course, um, I don't think you will leave your children unattended, will you? 
And for all the female um, listeners um, today, I've included this one on the left-hand side. We repair what your husband fixed. So add this sense of humor, of humor for the intuitive customer, but also create an emotional connection. It is about empathy, especially in times of crisis. So um, I think this is what you, what you should, what, what any company should be focusing on, creating this emotional connection with the customer. For example, when you have customer service um, calls. And then it's not just about evoking emotions with your customers, but it's also recognizing emotions. Now, usually it's being said that there are seven basic emotions out there and um, there's technology that can help you out to help you detect customers' emotions in real time. Interface on the left and Affectiva on the right have analyzed millions of faces up to this moment. And with, its, with the Halo app, Amazon um, has this new device that enables them next to monitoring your sleep and your body fat and your activity to constantly listen, listening to your tone of voice. And from that, they can detect your current emotional state. Just imagine what a wealth of data that provides them with. So they can now tailor the recommendation, personalize it, not just to your demographics or to your past purchases, but also to your current emotional state. And then last but not least, it's also about creating these Instagrammable experiences because we're so influenced. Create experiences that people want to talk about and share with their peers on, uh, on social media or just face to face. And I love this example, again, a Dutch example of one supermarket chain that created the chit chat cash register, where actually people who are not in a hurry can stand in line and have a chat uh, whilst they are taking care of, of um, uh, paying for their, for their stuff. And also at the same time, because we're so influenced, I mentioned this earlier on, make it easy to review you. If you ask properly, 90% of people will provide you with a review. And so since 70% of reviews online are positive, it's worthwhile doing so. Because you know, most customers won't complain anyway. They will simply just never do business with you again. So five characteristics to take into account to augment the customer experience, to create advocates, ambassadors through a better customer experience. And then the one question I always get asked, of course, is Nancy, does this pay off? And I was really happy with this report from the Temkin Group that really shows that it does. So even a moderate improvement in the customer experience will generate more revenue. And I've done the math on these numbers because these are calculated over three years. And if you do this um, globally or, or over all sectors, it is a 21% year over year increase um, that you can achieve. And in times of crisis, as um, uh, Forrester showed, it is a wise thing to focus on customer experience. It's truly a winning strategy in recession times. And so using technology can help you a great deal with this. But one thing that you need to always keep in mind in this journey of technology innovation is that we need to keep people at the center of the equation. And that's what I think what Walmart did so well when they expanded the use of their in-store robots. They really did this to free up their store associates from mopping the floor or checking, checking inventory so they could focus on helping customers. And by the way, this is both beneficial for the customer and for the employee. So I've showed you high tech, and I showed you high touch and how both are very important. Now, I've talked to you about CX um, um, up until now. A lot of companies tell me that they already compete on this, on this uh, piece on, on customer experience. And that might be the case, although I don't truly believe this percentage to be so high in, in reality. What I do know is that EX or employee experience is next. And it is basically unexplored territory for a lot of organizations. And in this space too, sustainable transformation needs to take place. Gallup found in its um, state of the global workplace um, that 80% 
of employees are either not engaged or actively disengaged. And the latter are the silent killers of the organization. Now, luckily for you, I found that your NPS, your ENPS score is great and that you do very well on sites like Glassdoor. But for many organizations, the battle for the employee is definitely on. And so the, the question is then, how do you make your company attractive for future employees? And this is what some leaders tend to forget, that if you want to win out there, you have to win on the inside first. And EX typically starts with culture. It's about our actions and it's about our attitude. And this attitude is, is hard to grasp, right? There's a lot of definitions on culture. We probably all know the one top right from Peter Drucker. I love the one top left from the late Herb Kelleher, who said that culture is what people do when no one's looking. And so we basically, CX is all about your brand. EX is of course, all about your culture. The two of them need to go hand in glove. What's essential is what you say you are externally should be very hard to distinguish from what you do internally. There should be a blend of brand and culture. And I would say that's when you get good sex with a C, mind you, referring to customer and employee experience. And so improve this employee experience, for example, by redesigning your organization. Um, I don't know about your BMI, by the way, I'm not referring to your body mass index here, but I'm referring to, to your bureaucracy mass index. How pervasive is bureaucracy within your organization? The excess of it costs um, um, the global economy a lot of money, as you can see. So how much time and energy does it suck up at your company? I always advise organizations to um, move away from being a traditional um, hierarchy where information moves slowly, where you have teams and silos, um, towards becoming a more responsive network where inf information can go quickly. And these responsive networks allow for better collaboration. And this is necessary because we need to bridge this collaboration gap that exists between how leaders think how easy leaders think it is to collaborate within the organizations versus how employees feel about that. Next, of course, it's also about um, perfecting the technology aspect within your company, using all these new technologies out there, but at the same time, of course, also reskilling your workforce. Um, not only implementing new technologies, but actually showing them how to use it in exactly the right way. And so I mentioned earlier, it's about leveraging the data, it's about leveraging the technologies. And I think it's crucial to include that we need to adopt new ways of working. The three of them together make up digital transformation. There are multiplication, if one is omitted, it's going to fail. And that's what I've seen happening throughout my career. Um, many of the transformations fail because we don't take the humans into account enough. And then finally, improving EX has to do with culture, as I mentioned earlier, but also with leadership and, and communication. Culture doesn't just happen organically. Leaders who believe this think it's out of their control. So if you truly want to lead um, culture in your organization, it is about communication, speaking in an ongoing way, accessible to all employees and relevant to your purpose. Listening in a connected or I would say 3D way. So listening for what's being said, for how it's being said, but also listening for what's not being said. And then finally, of course, it's also about walking the talk. And as you can see from the numbers, there's a great deal of organizations where leadership can really communicate well through speaking, but actually their behavior doesn't really align with um, the culture that they talk about. So if you want to improve the EX, it's basically the same as a CX. Look at all of the touch points and try to improve on every single one of them. And yeah, the question I get asked is exactly the same as with customer experience, of course. Nancy, is it going to pay off? And yes, it is. 
both on the soft side, as you can see on the on the left hand side, and on the on the number side on the right hand with revenue, profit, and productivity going up. I think personally, it is this infinite loop. If you augment the, the employee experience, you will get more engaged employees who will deliver a better customer experience, leading to more engaged customers. And of course, it's much nicer as an employee to do business with an engaged customer, augmenting your experience once again. So it does pay to focus on these two. Remember the good sex. So then in concluding, what should be your strategy for this, for this next normal? Um, it will be one of continuous change. We will keep evolving in an exponential way. And that means that we need to deal with this change or become obsolete. And it means that we will re have to learn a lot new of new stuff, but I think we also need to unlearn a lot of new stuff. Oh, sorry, a, a lot of old stuff. So be willing to let go of your darlings, kill your mantras. You can't keep on doing everything the way you used to. If this is what you do, you may end up looking ridiculous like this lady does. By the way, if you show this to a 15 year old, they don't get the joke. It is about speed. If you aim for the status quo, that will mean decline. So speed is required instead of inaction. As the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland puts it so nicely, you need to run twice as fast to keep on moving forward. There will be some strategic shifts required, doing more experiments, taking more risks. And will you spend money and time on experiments, if you, even if you know that two out of three projects fail? And that's fail is also this thing that um, differentiates a fixed mindset from a growth mindset. In the fixed mindset, people see failure as a limit of their abilities. People with a growth mindset see it as um, a new opportunity. It's moving from avoiding challenges to embracing them. Developing from know-it-alls to learn-it-alls, that's going to be crucial. We all need to overcome this fear of failure. And I love the quote from Thomas Edison, which said, I would never failed. I just found so many ways that don't work. And for me, FAIL is this acronym for first attempt in learning. So indeed, foster a culture of innovation in the now, the next, and the beyond, and make sure that you keep this a people first innovation with the customer and the employee in the center. And of course, many people, or maybe some people, are afraid that everything's going to digitize. They tend to have this view of man versus machine. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's about man with machine. We're not going to be replaced. We're going to be promoted because of technology. The right combination of human and machine maybe doesn't create perfection, but it will help both of us getting better by working together. It's not just AI, artificial intelligence, but it's IA, intelligence amplification. As Satya Nadella, Nadella put it so nicely, it's intelligent technology amplifying our human ingenuity. And especially, of course, our human creativity is really important here. So technology is the enabler. It's us, the humans, that make it work. The human is so important in the digital transformation it is truly about finding the sweet spot between high tech on the one hand and high touch on the other. Because in the end, it is all about the wow, about creating this wow experience. The time to get client centric is now because tomorrow might be too late. And I would love to end with a quote from Maya Angelou, which is from the old normal, but still very relevant in this next normal. And she says that people will forget what you said or what you did, but they will never forget the way you made them feel. And with that, I'd like to thank you very, very much for listening.